Welcome, everybody, to the Old Gold Show. With you, as always, I'm co-manager over at Hammer and Rails, Andrew Ledman. And I'm Casey. Take me to Phoenix! Bartley, Boiler Upload, Rivals Network. And we're coming to you today, home of the Field of 68, Purdue's Final Four representative. I just, I can't believe it. Wait, there wasn't an uh, NC State podcast? I don't know. Actually, there was no. well, I mean, there's there, no well, chance. There there was ones, Lemon. No chance. There may be no a Yukon one. There may be a Yukon one. I don't know. Well, Doster um, is the Yukon guy, so I think well, I don't think they count. needed. Yeah, I don't think they needed help. Okay, so we're just holding it down here for Field of 68 with the Final Four coming up right around the corner. Purdue heading there for the first time since 1980. Casey and I were there both games, and look, we talked about it beforehand how we're going to handle this. We Casey was right. I, I'll grant him this. I thought we should cover the games first and then get into the emotion. But he pointed out rightly so that if we start talking about the games, there's going to be no way that we don't leave the emotion out of it. So we're we're going to try to get all the emotion and all the happening out of the way now, so that then in the second half we can cover the games. So how did I describe uh, it, Ledman? You did not, uh, as far as I recall. Um, that's going to leave be be left on the cutting room floor. So, you know, obviously it was it was great to be there at the Sweet Sixteen because you and I had covered one Sweet Sixteen in the past together uh, when Purdue went to St. Peter's, and we we all know how that worked out. We had all these plans to cover the Elite Eight game in in Philadelphia. Purdue loses. We don't get to do it. And I've I've never left a buddy so fast, Ledman. <laughs> uh, before we even left the arena, I said, "Hey, by the way, I know we were going to spend a weekend together. We're going to do some fun things. I'm leaving. Yeah, I'm getting like, I'm on the uh, first looking, flight I can get out. I'm rebooking my flight as mm. we drive back from. I'm Philadelphia. spending a hundred dollars yeah, yeah. to spend less time with you, Lip. That, that's what I did. I think it was a steal, personally. I, I mean, <laughs> with my attitude at that point, I would have paid double. So." Yeah, I, mm. Uh, I was, you know, I was praying for the loneliness and quiet of a of an airplane. Yeah. So you know, we were there for the game against Gonzaga. We were on different tiers for that game. You were down we were on, on the floor. We were on the edge of our seats, Ledman. We yeah, on the edge. <laughs> you you were down on the floor for that Gonzaga game. I was up high in the gondola, mm -hmm. as they call it. Uh, had to lean over my chair and do a little bit of this, which I want to point out. So. They have just like a, a almost like bar seating up there. Like there's mm -hmm. just a bar that goes across, and they've got stools, and you sit in front of it, yep. which is fine. I'm not yep. going to complain. Mm -mm. Then, however, for nachos, exactly. For the five foot six reporter, they had the bar, and then for me, for my seat that was assigned, there was a little jut out, so it goes mm. even further. So I was mm. even further from the edge, and I had to. Eat, lean a little bit more over mm. just so I could see. But uh, you had no such problems down there on the floor schmoozing with the likes uh, of indie star reporter extraordinaire Greg Doyle um, and folks from you know the local news stations. But that's okay. I wasn't mad because I was there I, and I got to watch the game. I've been up there, Ledman. Um, I have vivid remember like memories of hearing Isaac Haas's elbow yeah. hit the ground, which you could hear all the way up at the top of the rafters. Oh, oh. It That's, was a nope. sickening sound. So every, I mean, every time there's a hook and hold, you can have that moment to think of. Perfect. That was Perfect. the play. Yeah. So Purdue, I, I, how nervous were you going into that Sweet 16 game? Because you seemed pretty confident for most of when, you know, when I talked to you yeah, before the game, um, you had a pretty good energy about you. You were, you were confident. Yeah, there, there was nothing particularly about Gonzaga that on a basketball court scared me for Purdue. Um, the, the things they did well, their little wrinkles were things that I thought fit into Purdue's game plan and how they wanted to play. I thought Purdue was just physically um, more than Gonzaga. And while there's a lot of things that are up to luck and how did things bounce, when you're just physically more than a team, that that's generally going to wear on you. And when you play seven guys, uh, the thing yeah, about the tough. Gonzaga game was Gonzaga gave a really good shot in the first half, played well, defended Edie hard. Like there was a lot of stuff that was good by what Gonzaga did. But as soon as that second half started, it was just like, they're gone. They're gassed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, EK defended well 
And then, you know, he picks up three fouls in like five minutes of action. Yeah. Is a little bit of that. Refs don't know. Refs are uncomfortable, like calling the same amount of fouls, I feel like. And maybe, maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's when you don't get a whistle in the first half. Maybe players adjust and they think they can get away with more. So there's more whistles in the second half. Yeah, I think that's. I think, I think there's a, l- a lot of that. And then you just get more tired the longer you have to deal with Zach yeah. You're going to like not be able to like present it as not a foul as much, even if you're doing so, similar stuff. So when in that game did you kind of accept that like Purdue's going to the to Elite Eight, we're going to be here again tomorrow, and I got to prepare for that? Because that obviously, you know. I, as- that, I mean, that's not how I view a game, Lidman. Um it like it's not it's it would be dishonest for me to say like it's certainly not the Gonzaga game. I, I get uncomfortable when those emotions do creep in like it's been two years now I've covered the team full um been in every game you know you gotta wear the media bias but I, I've covered right. a lot of tournament games at this point it's like eight seasons deep um and it, it really only flares up in the big 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 time stuff like it definitely yeah. did a little bit in the Tennessee game, but like the Gonzaga game was never particularly close. Braden Smith was so damn good. Yeah. Um, and I think when you watch something like that, there is a different um, energy when a team is playing that well, based off of a point guard than like, like we've seen Purdue, like Zach, he's been awesome for two straight years. Like there's just yeah. not been a bad game, but it's a different energy when it's, when it's your lead guard that's playing in a way that's like yeah. all time. Great. Because like you can't yeah, it's just shut a different that kind off. of basketball. When you have 15 assists, like there's nothing you can do to shut that off, and there was nothing Gonzaga yeah. could do. And, and Smith was doing stuff where like uh, Lance Jones is up next to him, left on the corner. So get out he of just here! Yells, he goes, yeah, yells, <laughs> the whole time. go to the corner, and Lance Jones runs down to the baseline, over to the corner. Two seconds later, Smith is hard dribbling left, passing over the defense to the corner. Lance Jones, wide open, sank a three. When yeah. when you see something like that and you just watch this master on the court, the only thing you're doing is in awe. Like, you're like, Bra- that guy's not losing. This happened in the Tennessee game, too, obviously. I, I, for the Tennessee game, I was able, I got a floor, floor seat so I could see things uh, much clearer. Um, and, I mean, during that second half, Braden Smith was just yelling at everybody. And I don't mean that in a like a mean mm-hmm. way or like a you know he's a not a team player kind of way. I mean they, he's like this. I am the I am the point guard. You will listen to me. I am running this offense. I mean he like you said he's yelling at Lance Jones over there, over there, out of the way, like directing him where to go. And I mean you know Jones is like yes sir, and just like right. runs across the floor. You like, know he's like he trusts him. Yeah, you need that orchestration and like. If you want to talk a material difference between this year's team and last year's team, a true freshman point guard can't do that. True. Not going to do that. Very rarely. That I, I mean, it's rare for any guy to have that kind of control in an offense, but particularly a true freshman in the biggest game on the biggest stages, like to, to watch the maturation of just what he's been able to do both physically, because he can do stuff he can't do last year, obviously, yeah. but even more so just the emotional intelligence, the intelligence, 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 the smart, smart. Yeah. Just knowing yeah. where people need to be, knowing how to get the ball, where to get them the ball, when to get them the ball, all the stuff. And just that's away from Zach Eady, who is the most dominant player in college basketball, maybe in three decades. And like when you can put those two things on the floor together, we, we talk about it. Purdue doesn't need a singular third star to come up. They just need a third person at any point in the game to play well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like, for moments, it was Lance Jones was great in that first half with Gonzaga. A big part of Purdue's lead was Lance Jones' twelve points in the first half. He made some tough shots, made some plays. That that's great. And Lawyer was good in the second half. Like yeah. Purdue doesn't need or Trey was really good to start off in the second half. Purdue doesn't need a constant third. They just need a little bit of a third. And like that's so easy. Like yeah, it's really yeah. easy because so trying to follow your direction and put all the talk of the game in the second half. We'll move on. Ah, See, you, you're you kind of, you're right. the one that's the problem now. So maybe we just go get, we'll talk Gonzaga first, and then we'll, 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 we'll all right, down. All right, we're fine. already in it. Well, now it would yeah. be, now it seemed like you're forcing silly. emotion on us. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, as a Purdue fan, and yes, I do cover the team, but less seriously than Casey. I mean, let's be honest. He, he is with the team. He goes to practices. He's been to every game for multiple seasons in a row. Um, I watch the vast majority of the games home 
at home in Maryland, and I go no to the pants. occasional away game. No, yeah, that's just a personal preference. That has nothing to do with <laughs> basketball. Um, you know, covered them. I went. I went to Hawaii to cover the game. Went mm-hmm. to the Maryland game, um, and I've I've covered these last two games here in the Sweet Sixteen and Elite Eight. Um, and I'll I'll you know perfectly acknowledge I'm far more of a fan than a journalist. Um, for me, it was as I'm watching that game and seeing the way Braden Smith is playing. I'm of two minds. Like as the person who has to write a story about the game, Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, this is going to be a Braden Smith story. Like it's got to talk about how great he was in this game, almost getting a triple double for either the third or fourth time this year. Um, And, and just as you said, how he's matured from one season to the next. But then the, the fan part of my brain is like, they could still blow this. Like something (laughs) could happen. I'm like, I've got that that fear from all of the tournament losses and especially the tournament loss in the elite eight, uh, you know, in Louisville against Virginia has never really left my lizard brain. So it's always there. Right. And as I was watching it, it's just like, okay, I think when, when they got up about like 12 with just a few minutes to go was when I finally was like, okay, I'm going to stop like, being so afraid and that's when i basically wrote the vast majority of the story um that i posted right after but um you know it was it was a big it's it was a big moment and we talk about the run this team has had to go on because of what they did last year because of that loss and how each game seems seems like it's more important than the last and of course it is as you move to the final four but that pressure just seems to build and build and build. And I don't know if you saw the uh, Dana O'Neill story in the athletic uh, Mm -hmm. talking about uh, Purdue and Matt Painter. And I did not realize that um, Tony Bennett coach of Virginia, they, he literally, when, when they won their first round (laughs) game after um, losing to the 16th seed the year previously, he literally had a stuffed monkey and grabbed it off of his back and threw it on the ground because he finally got that monkey off his back. So, um, all it all time been fun. painter retort. Well, I, yeah, I don't remember what he said. He's like, "Ooh, I think I need a grand piano." <laughs> yes, that's what it was. That's what it was. So, I mean, they knew the nature of the moment, not, not only in the first round, but as each each round gets you know closer and closer to the final four. And as, as you said, I mean, Braden Smith basically won this game for Purdue because he ran such a perfect offense. Um, everything about that game. The way that he ran it was was absolutely beautiful to see, and one of, if not his very best game as a Purdue player. Yeah, I it, you can't argue 14, 15, and eight in a Sweet yeah. Sixteen. Like, it, you, your career could end tomorrow, and that's a, that's a pretty hell of a good like stat line to carry with you at your best game. Uh, it's. I kind of tweeted this before. I don't remember which game it was before. It might have been the Elite Eight game, but it it never really felt like this team, like they were carrying the weight of other seasons or the 44 years of Purdue. Yeah, it was it was before the Elite Eight game. Yeah. Okay. It it they just I I think they knew what they had with Zach Eady. I think they know what they have with this team. So like if there was any pressure or whatever, it was just that they needed to capitalize on how special they were. And I yeah. think that speaks to their, you know, emotional toughness to be able to just like those are things they can like control their team, their action, their expectations. You're never going to be able to take on 44 years. Like that, right, that, right. Those are your ghosts. Yeah, and it's not at fair. Point. Yeah, it's it's not fair to ask them to do that either. And, and like you know, I, it, I wrote I wrote an article basically the exact opposite of your tweet saying how if <laughs> Purdue makes the final four it would mean so much because of these things and because of this. And I think both of those things are true. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. how Purdue fans feel. But that doesn't mean that that's how the team has to take it. And that's clearly not what they're doing. You know, they have these things maybe in the back of their head, but they know what they have, as you said. Yeah. One, I mean, one of the toughest things you can do as a person and like one of the most important things you can do as a person is not accept baggage that you don't have to handle. Like yeah. it's heavy and like seasons get long and like, wearing all that all the time like it's not sustainable i mean that's part of why mm-hmm. coaching so hard right because at the end of the day you kind of do have to carry all that stuff because it, uh, it's it's the baggage you accept in your contract right yeah because like you're, you're not a player you're not out there on the floor you're 
you're building a legacy, you're trying to fix a legacy, especially with Painter, who is so tied into Purdue and Gene mm-hmm. Cady and everything else. So like, yeah, for lack of a better word, like that's that's the tax of being the adult in the room. Like that's yeah. that's what you have to handle, just because. Yeah, that's if, if that is the emotional like weight that was lifted with the Elite Eight game. Yeah, that's why now, the final there- four matters. Right. There's there's one more thing that I want to ask you about mm-hmm. in the Sweet 16 game, and then we can, if you want to take a break, we can take a break, or we can just go right into the, to the Tennessee game. I love so breaks. What did, what did you think of Ethan Morton coming in with nine and a half seconds left and committing two fouls um, over a six-second span uh, in order to kind of disrupt yeah. the Gonzaga offense? Yeah, I talked to him after the game, and I talked to him before. You know, I dropped a story that morning that just happened to be serendipity that like I, I I was talking to actually Carson Barrett, um walk on senior who got to make a three in the first game of the NCAA tournament with a torn meniscus. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if you've torn your meniscus, Ledman. I have, I have. not. I've no sounds it's awful. miserable. It is two months of misery. Like to play college basketball in that practice every day, like that that that's a dude that's given up a whole lot for his team. And that's kind of and I and you know, you talk to walk-ons and you're always like, is it worth it? And they're like, it's always more than you expect. Cause they knew what they were signing up for. Right. Um, but I'm like, Ethan didn't sign up to be a bench player. Ethan was a top 100 four-star recruit. Um, Ethan had offers from all over the place. Everyone wanted him. Like he was being recruited. He like played with Kofi Coburn on AAU team. Like he was, he was top of the line. Like he could have chose his location and he chose Purdue because of Matt Painter. Like he chose because the community reminded him of home. Like I've, I've talked to him for hours at this point on, on the things at West Lafayette and where he's from Butler, like how those things remind him of each other. Part of his story in high school was bringing that school, a district tournament that they hadn't had since his high school coach there played 30 years ago. Um, so like, he is one of the most emotionally intelligent players I've been around. Like he knows, like every time we talk, there's a little bit like, why are you talking to me? I'm I'm not on the floor. I'm not doing it. Um, he hasn't taken an amount of credit for any of the success and he's been there uh, multiple times. Like I, I, I remember talking to him last year and he, he kind of told me like, we haven't done anything and the guys before us took so many lumps for us that they don't really, he doesn't deserve the credit for where the program is right now. Three straight number one rankings, because like those guys before them took all the lumps and he's just kind of here observing it. And I think that's, I mean, certain personalities are like that, right? You're not going to take credit. You're, you're almost too analytical of the fact of you're like, why didn't play? I'm not one of the best guys now when it comes to the end of the season, but like there's not a guy in that locker room that doesn't speak to how his leadership and his knowledge and him keeping everyone on the same page. And like, if there's a guy in the locker room that has a question, they go to Ethan Morton first and his ability to bridge the gaps of all those personalities is just like, you need that. Yeah. Cause yeah, it's not I, I mean, easy. I, I thought it was a great moment just that he was able to get in there because as you said, he, he just, Hey, he's been overtaken by other players on this team. And that is the nature of college basketball. And painter mentioned it. And I can't remember if it was after the sweet 16 game or the elite eight game, but he talked about one of the hardest things about coaching is he recruits all these guys. He believes in all these guys. He believes in their heart. He believes in their effort. And he's got guys, and he didn't mention them by name, but it, it, I mean, it was it was clear who he was talking about. Guys like Caleb First and guys like Ethan Morton, who he believes in, he recruited, he knows they're capable. But right now, they're just not, you know, one of his most athletic guys right. that he has to get on the floor. And he said that's one of the hardest parts about coaching is having to talk to those guys and be like, "Look, here's here's why you're not getting these minutes," and just even if you don't talk to them, you, they know. I mean, that you know. They understand what's going on, and I thought it was good that Ethan Morton even got those six seconds, went in there and did a job. 
and yeah. he did it well. He did exactly what he needed to do. Purdue fans gave him a standing ovation when he left that that game with three and a half seconds left. I was going to say that exactly because like you go in for six seconds, you get two fouls. That stat line lives in infamy. There are going to be people mm-hmm. on Twitter. There were people on Twitter. Uh, you saw it. I saw it. That make fun of a stat line like that. But when he walked off the court, Purdue fans stood up out of their chairs and gave him a standing O. And there might not be another chance for that. And they took it. No. And like that is that is a beautiful little six second of basketball on something that other people will turn into a joke on Twitter. So like just props yeah. for that moment, props for this fan base and the way they understand in real time the sacrifice that someone like Ethan Morton does give. And like if you want to talk about a memory we'll think of in that game in 20 years from now, I almost guarantee you it'll be that moment over anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Purdue had a four point lead at that point, And there was, I think everybody had a little bit of a fear, you know, nine and a half seconds left. Your opponent has the ball. You want to go into halftime with momentum. Yep. You want to prevent your opponent from having momentum. If they come down and drill a three, take the lead down to one, go into the locker room after hitting a big shot, you know, that'll really pump him up. That could feed him into the second half. But Matt Painter said, hey, Ethan, go in there, disrupt the flow of their offense. We got fouls to give. You're not going to send them to the line. You know, do do this for us. And he did it. No questions asked, no problems. And ultimate result, Gonzaga didn't score. And Purdue went into the locker room up four, came out, as you said, great start of the second half with Trey Kaufman Wren. And Purdue kind of ultimately ran away with it there and and won by 12. So each piece matters, and Ethan Morton did what he was asked to do, and and I think that was awesome. Yep. Yeah, so that is enough on this Gonzaga game. Let's take a break, look at Tennessee, and how Purdue wound up in the Final Four. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines for making all of our picks and predictions, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money to get it. This is what you have to do to make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using that bonus code at FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You'll get up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your bet loses. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly... We have some fun stuff coming up for the rest of the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boost, and the thing that I love the most, a nice little parlay boost, as well as a ridiculous array of prop bets for anything that you could possibly imagine betting on. From odds on getting to the Final Four to national championship futures, I'm calling it right now. BetMGM is the king of the prop bet. So go download the BetMGM app. Use that code FIELD and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod in any podcast app. Like and share the YouTube videos that you enjoy. Tell your friends about us. It all helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. And we are back. So, game two of the weekend. Purdue, Tennessee. Purdue comes away 72-66, to Victor, which was Oh, so close to the score in Hawaii, which was 75 to 67, or I'm sorry, 71 to 67, pretty one by four. Long time um, and now they win by six. So uh, two points better in the NCAA tournament than they were in Maui. Um, I mean, this one was a true heavyweight fight. You had Zach Eady scoring 40 points. You had Dalton Connect scoring 37. And Connect really, uh, I think, he played a ton better in this game than he did in Hawaii against Purdue. And he truly made an argument that he might be the second best player in the country. Yeah. I, I think most people were there already with that. Um, I do some think people think he's the, some people, Tennessee fans I, argue he's the best. Have you heard it after They're the wrong. game? Because I, I think if anything, the connect, you <sighs> Offensively, I think he's a lot closer to Zach Eady um, than maybe even Purdue g- people give him credit for because like he's a phenomenal yeah. scorer in the basketball. But Connect is a two way player. It, like the the difference between the way Zach Eady affects the floor on defense, which controlled Tennessee the whole game, uh, 
compared to like Purdue turned it around when they started attacking Dalton Connect at the other end. And that yes. was, and I mean, you saw you saw you saw Fletcher Lawyer do it. I think on two straight possessions, yep. um, they just went right after him and resulted in easy buckets. And I think that is something that Purdue maybe learned throughout the game because, as you said, not exactly a strength of his um, his defense, and Purdue was able to take advantage. Well, it's not even about learn because, like, that's how Fletcher got twenty seven against yeah, Tennessee the first time. Like, Dalton Connect is a great player. He is not good on defense. Um, just point blank, uh, got lost quite a few times, could have given up more points than he did. Uh, and I think it, it shines well for Purdue going forward. Cause Purdue's about to play a team. We won't get into that obviously in this one, but they're about to play a team where execution and attacking weak spots is going to be very important. Yeah. And I thought Purdue did a really good job for the most part on like Dalton connect couldn't miss early. And then lawyers started to attack him on defense. And all of a sudden that mid range shot, not quite as comfortable when you have to work that hard on defense. It's right. just not, it's yeah. It doesn't make sense like logically, but like if, if you get burned on defense, if you're working harder on defense, offense becomes harder. And that's really what they were able to do. And Purdue this year has multiple guys and multiple ways to attack teams. And I'm not sure that was the case last year, but now between Braden Smith and the way he attacks, pick and roll, driving, shooting, uh, Fletcher Lawyer has always been a good scorer, has always been craftier than you think. And then mm-hmm. even Trey Kaufman as a four, Lance Jones with his speed. There there are areas that Purdue can attack. And that balance serves well when you're playing teams. In, in theory, yeah. the deeper you get in the tournament, the, the less those things should show up because teams are generally obviously better. Like when you, when you take on UConn, there's not really a weak spot, but yeah. like Tennessee had one flaw on defense and it was Dalton connect and Purdue took advantage of it. And that's the sign of a team that's executing. It's playing well. That's not getting ahead of itself. It's sticking to what like the coaching staff had them prepared for that. Like, Hey, this is where we can attack them. They're a great defensive team with one weak spot. And sticking to that is harder to do when you're, you know, between the whistles. But, like, Purdue did a good job of it. And those six points, like, that's all that separated the two teams. And that's just Mm -hmm. a couple times down taking on a weakness. Yeah. And, I mean, to emphasize just how important Connect was to them on the offensive end, all you have to do is look at the stat sheet. I mean, he scored 37 points of their 66. He took 31 shots of their 62 shots. So fully half of their shots came from one player. He was out there 37 minutes. He hit six threes. Uh, the rest of the team hit five, which, you know, uh, pretty good. But They started off more... seven of ten from three. And he started off four for four and then finished the game two of, t- or I'm sorry, six of 12. So he was two of his next eight um, after Purdue basically switched Lance Jones onto him um, mm. as the main defender, which I thought it was interesting. They didn't do that uh, to start the game, but I-, I didn't see an explanation as to why that was the case. Um, so the case was that Ziegler getting going is really what makes Tennessee's offense hum as a whole. Cause he's such a good facilitator. Um, and they wanted Lance Jones at the top, cutting that off. And I, it's hard to argue it's not super hard to argue because you watch Connect score 37 and you're like, that's right. a problem. Yeah. But you can also, I, I think three of those first four threes were off of offensive rebounds. When and That sounds right. So Purdue's defense worked, got a stop, then just couldn't get a rebound. And then you just, I, it, it's hard to stick to a guy when the ball's up in the air and you're trying to get a rebound. Yeah. So like those aren't defensive breakdowns. Those are rebounding breakdowns. Yeah. And and so Purdue if, had at least Purdue had at least two occasions where they had either had the rebound or right. had a, a steal and then it just they lost it and it went right back to Tennessee, resulting in two threes. Um yeah. so, so if you, those if, are those are frustrating. If you cut that down and Dalton's all of a sudden going like if Connect is has thirty one points on thirty shots, you feel like you like A plus the effort. Um, yeah. But I do think, uh, obviously, what you're giving up is you're putting Braden Smith on Connect and Connect his ability to just go over him and shoot. But at the same time, I think I think part of the gamble is okay, Connect, kill us from the mid range. Don't try to get other people going. 
just take mm-hmm. that shot. And I understand that philosophy when you have Zach Eady on the other floor. Because yeah. are your two pointers going to be more efficient than our two pointers? I bet they're not, is yeah. what Matt Painter is saying. And I get bad fruit, but obviously it's a six point game, a couple shots. It, Purdue also goes three of 15 from three. Right. And if they make three more threes, are we talking about defense in any capacity or are we just talking no. about Purdue steamrolling Tennessee? Right. Yeah. I mean, Purdue had no player hit more than one three. Mm-hmm. Um, 15 in the game, as you said, started out the game 0 for 6. Uh, Braden Smith was the first one to hit it on Purdue's seventh attempt from three. And at that point, Purdue really wasn't down that bad. And it was one of those things you're looking at the stats and you're like, you know, Purdue is not playing that great, but they're not down very much. So the thinking, at least, you know, among myself uh, was if Purdue could just get to their average, they could put this Tennessee team away. They never did that. They never did that at the three point line or the free throw line. Ended up 21 of 33 for 63%. And some of those were front end to one and ones. And uh, Zach Eady missed eight free throws, 14 to 22, including an air ball in the second half where I think his legs were just done. Um, I mean, he only rested, he only rested like 33 seconds. 33 seconds, seconds yeah. So he was out there for 39 minutes at 7'4, 300 pounds. And uh, he, you know, he had to be out there. Um, Painter believed in him. He wanted to be out there and he played and he scored 40 points for the first time in his career, grabbed 16 rebounds. So he, he had a masterful, masterful performance. And it, it was, there, there was only one moment in the game where it really obviously felt like Purdue might be in some deep, deep trouble. And that was when it was 32 to 21 painter takes a timeout and I, you can just feel it in the arena, people getting, antsy people getting anxious people getting uncomfortable after that Purdue goes on a 15 to 2 run and goes into halftime ahead but in that moment sitting in it during that timeout was was a tough moment yeah that was a ball game right like Mm -hmm. Tennessee had their shot uh Smith had to go to the bench for a little while he comes in makes a big three I can't remember what the second play he had back-to-back plays that were just huge one was the pull-up three and there was something else and just to be able to have, like, once again, his his stat line in this game doesn't look as impressive. But right. nine points, seven rebounds, seven assists. He came out firing, um, controlling the game at just everywhere offensively. And then it was it was a bad Lance Jones first half. Yes. To put it he had mildly. bad moments in both halves. He had bad moments in both halves. I mean, you know... There was talk amongst the media members of, do we think Jones might need to sit for a few minutes to start this second half? Um, Didn't happen. He was really good on connect in the second half. Yes, much better. Much better. Still had had a couple turnovers where you're like, what are we doing? What are we doing? It's, it is what it is at this point. Obviously, he's not having the hot, hot stretch of putting up 20 plus a game that he had in the middle of the season, but like, he still brings them something that Purdue doesn't have. And like defensively, he's he's able to guard so many different types. Mm. Being able to give Ziegler problems and connect at the same time in the same game is pretty wild. Yeah, that's tough. Um, but then I I think if if I'm thinking of anything else about this game, it's those final five minutes when for about a minute and a half, Purdue got into a bad habit of just throwing the ball into Edie and then stopping. No movement yeah. around him. Um, he got to the free throw line a couple times, absolutely. But like uh, we've just seen it before, where the offense stagnates late and just tries to just tries to hover above the water and not fall in, like just barely yeah. keep your head above it. And then they yeah. came out of the media timeout and they went right back to Smith pick and roll. And he got ED for a dunk. I think there was a turnover in there, but just that movement, that liveliness, that getting ED good looks and not just the defense couldn't, couldn't know for sure what they were doing. Like they couldn't just sit on the post. And I think there was getting to that is very important going forward. Yeah. There was, there was a point where Purdue was up. I want to say eight points. And it was around that five minute mark, or if not, a, you know, a minute or two on the other side. But it really felt like Purdue was going to push t- 
Tennessee away. They were going to run away with the game. And then, as you said, they got into their just give it to Zach offense and kind of just stop. Because we want to get the ball to Zach. You know, Matt Painter said it in the post game. I told the guys in the huddle, we got to give the big man the right of first refusal. That doesn't mean he's got to shoot it every time, but he's got to touch it every time and make the decisions and make the right choices. And I mean, I agree. You got to get your national player of the year, the ball, but you got to listen to the second half of what painter says there. It's he doesn't have to shoot. He's got to make the decision. So that means the other four guys on the court got to be moving. They got to be running the offense. They can't just be standing around and hoping that Zach Eady makes the bucket. They've got to, they've got to be continuously moving um, and and running that offense even while Zach Eady has the ball. And that can – we've seen Purdue fall into that trap of not doing anything, and that does not work out well for them. But for this one, um, Eady made all the right decisions. Purdue walks out with a six-point victory. And you do you want to talk about the block before we get into the celebration? Yeah, because, like, let's talk. And the Jones three. I mean, those were the two moments at the end of the game. Yeah, so the Jones three for sure is just a moment where we've seen it from Lance a lot. Just that late game need a three, he yep. makes it. Um, yeah. I don't know what they put in your bloodstream to make that be a part of your DNA, but he got it. And he's got it for sure. That I mean, that shot won the game. Yeah, like hands because that pushed the lead back to six. To six, yeah, like that. That was the shot. Um, and like just Bravo. Like, like we talked about last year, we just need someone to want to take it. Mm-hmm. And, and he wants to take it, sometimes to the to the detriment, yeah. but he'll take it. <laughs> but he's got a lot of guys that want it this year, and that's good. Um, but then, yeah, the, just the – what a perfect metaphor for what this Purdue team is, Zach Eady's entire story, this team's entire story, that Zach Eady airballs a free throw, misses the front end, and airballs the second. Yeah. Air balls the same. And it is so easy for that to spiral. For that to end worse than it did. Because, like, that's embarrassing. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's just flat embarrassing. The biggest moment, like, those free throws, those free throws would have sealed the game. Mm-hmm. And Zach Eady airballed. Just yipped it. Mm-hmm. Didn't even come close. Missed it by three inches. Like, the rim. Just. Yeah. Bad. And then to come down and get the block of the year. Like Dalton Connect is the on Dalton Connect in it with Dalton Connect know. is the second best player in college basketball. He said, Here's my moment, one bucket here, and we are in this. They're they are gonna feel us with this layup. And Zach Eady, just the amount of body control to not just fully go into connect there to reach up and around and to time that block off the left hand away from the hoop. Like that's just unbelievable. Just like, and he kept it in bounds. What he kept it in bounds. Yeah. Yeah. So the ball stayed with Purdue, like just a game winning play on the defensive end, something he doesn't get enough credit for. He's been so good this year. Purdue's entire, like you ask him, like, does your identity involve, entirely around Edie and they're like well not entirely but like it does his ability to just yeah. shut off that paint is so vital to what they do and to to, to make a game-winning defensive play on the heels of that air ball is just it, it, that's that's lebron chase down block yeah to come back yeah, to it was, i mean that like that's that's the kind of stuff we're talking here it was it to was get, a, it was a big moment just to a get huge moment purdue the Purdue team that neither you or I have ever seen make it have to the not, final have four. not been a, had not been alive the last time Purdue have made the final four in 1980. 1980. To have that moment in that play right before that to set that up for like it, just what a story for Zach Eady and this team and all the moments that like they airballed last year. What they did, they airballed against Fairleigh Dickinson. Yeah. And they have come back and answered every question. And now, like, Matt Painter got to stand and watch as, you know, his assistant coaches go up and cut the net. His guys, all while Gene Katie's standing next to him a lot. Like, yep. Gene Katie's very old. 
Yes. This, there's no reason that he, like, for a long time, it looked like he was never going to see it. And a lot of, it got to the point where it looked like Robbie Hummel was never going to see it. <laughs> it looked like, I don't know, I don't know that it I looked like it was like, none of us were ever going to see it. Levin. Ever going to yeah. see it. Not going to ever happen. And to, you know, as the game, as the clock tick, tip down, tick down and, and, Everybody really felt comfortable that the game was over. I whipped out my phone, just like almost everybody else on press row there and everybody in the stands. And I recorded those last few seconds of the game with lawyer having the ball and dribbling around and then throwing it up in the air um, as time expired. And I, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it. Um, Ryan Smith was was the row <laughs> behind yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And Paul Lusk comes into the crowd, gives him a big hug. Robbie Hummels over. Paul Lusk day. was hugging everybody. Was. I came up to congratulate him. He's like, "Hey, man, thanks for covering us." Hug. I'm like, "Oh, we've never hugged before." This is yeah, right. What a moment to get my first hug from Paul Lusk. You know, you'll never forget it. Uh, I mean, we got Robbie Hummel to our right, mm. uh, breaking down on the air. Um, Bobby Riddell and Rob Blackman are over there. You know, trying to get through it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, you know, we've got Matt Painter. Over there, getting the biggest hug in the world from you know the biggest basketball player in the country. Right after the game ends, that hug between Edie and Painter was was incredible. You got Edie cursing on the air, just dropping f bombs on the CBS. But like the second, but like the second time, just dropping it, just throwing it. Yeah, yeah. He, the Big Ten tournament one was this one. He was deranged. I think afterward, he said, like, yeah. "I don't know where I was." I'm like no one did. You you went he, up to the sky, big boy. He was just, locked in. Yeah, he was just, like, "They didn't. They thought possessed. they knew us. They didn't." And you're like. Who'd you think we were? You are. We are. <laughs> yeah. You get a big Pete Weber energy right there. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, they they bring everything out on the floor. The, they they get the, the trophy. They put up the stand and everybody's standing up there. And you just look around and uh, Matt Painter's daughter was on the floor. She was crying. Um, you know, other people who I have no idea who they are. I mean, they weren't like credentialed media. These were just like maybe they were families of players, families of coaches, administrators. I have no idea. You look around, like every third person was crying, rubbing their eyes, wiping away tears. You turn around and you look in the crowd, you know, as the band plays Hail Purdue, everybody is just standing, everybody's hugging, everybody's crying. Just an absolutely incredible moment to be able to be there in person, you know, on the floor watching these guys celebrate it. It It, it is something that I will truly never forget. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'll be covering this team next year. Um, I don't know what the future holds. Like nothing certain except that I know that I covered Purdue going to a final four. And that's, there's just not that many incredible sports stories to be involved with. And then when you tie it up to like, I was born in West or I was born in Lafayette. Um, like the, the only thing I've ever known is people just desperately wanting this team to get to here. And right. then somehow the story becomes even more deserving year after year. Like Matt Painter becomes Matt Painter. And then like you watch Robbie Hummel and you watch each one more and you, and you see all these guys get so close in so many different ways. And it all just collapses in a way where you're like, I don't believe why, why are we like it's season 24 of this show? Why are yeah. they getting more ridiculous yeah. with the storylines? Yeah, like, oh, really, yeah, now they're going to lose to Fairly Dickinson. Ha <laughs> ha. No one's going to believe this. Yeah. I mean, if if you haven't lived through it as a Purdue fan, it almost does seem comical to look back um, and see the ways in which all the way back to, through Gene Cady up to now, the way that Purdue has has lost rather than get to the final four. I mean, losing to a conference foe who you'd already beaten, um, you know, in 2000, going back to, you know, the three amigos and the elite eight, um, Glenn Robinson hurting his back. Um, Glenn Robinson. Uh, yeah. Glenn Robinson hurting his back in the, in the elite eight or in the sweet 16 and then not playing as well in the elite eight. Um, Isaac Haas's elbow, Robbie Hummel's knee. Um, Lou Jack gets injured too and has to, you know, fight his way back. And then the the Virginia game, fairly Dickinson loss. I mean, you you have to sit in all of those, and until you realize why this means so much to so many people, and you know, to hear Matt Painter talk about it was, it was so interesting because he he kept saying in the post game interviews, you know, when he was just out on the floor, and then when he did his long press conference, I don't know if I deserve this. Mm -hmm. 
That's what he just kept coming back to that. But Robbie, and Hummel he would does. say, Robbie Hummel does. Gene Cady does. I don't know that I do, but I'm here now. And it was just, I think it says a lot about him as a person to say how much he cares about those around him. And he understands that, like, yes, he's the coach. Yes, he's the representative. But he is not Purdue. You know, Purdue is so much more. And and he kept heaping praise on on players who came in his first couple years. You know, he name-checked David Teague and Carl Landry as guys who were there when he came in and became so much of a foundation. And the fact that the Baby Boilers, you know, committed to him when – he he talked about how bad their facilities were at the time and how much they needed upgrades and I think he said they weren't and, shit led them. Yes, he did. He did. I was trying to be a little nice. <laughs> um and he he talked about how there was no reason for those guys to commit to Purdue. There was no reason. He's he's this young guy who's just getting his first real coaching job at a at a at a major university and he's getting this big name recruits. He said it it he wanted it so badly for them. Um, and now they wanted it so badly for him. And it's just amazing how it comes, you know, full circle there. And it, it was incredible. Which is what, like, I think why why the wound is so raw for all these years is I think Purdue fans have believed in this program and these players and these coaches in a certain way. And just constantly the reply back is, well, where's the final four? Yeah, Where is it? And it wasn't, you know, I said before, it, it's not it's not so much a want for the happiness of it, it's just the relief to not have to, it almost felt like you had to apologize for all the things you believed in, because you believed in them so strongly without, without the, like, merit that we judge these things by. Like, I, I believed Matt Painter was a Final Four coach before this season. Yeah. I thought Gene Cady was. I thought Purdue Program was the elite of the elite. I thought they did things the right way, and these players are awesome. And they had awesome careers, and they did awesome things. But there's just this black hanging like, mark over the whole program because they haven't been able to do this one crazy thing that has always just, in comical ways, gotten in the way. And so to watch them cut down the net, and just this court full of people that just felt felt validated for the way they did things. Process over results. And like finally the results matched the process. Finally doing things right. Believing in Matt Painter. Believing in this program. Putting these pieces together. Believing in Zach Eady. Believing in Braden Smith. Believing in Fletcher Lord. Every game last year when people are like, why is Fletch out there? Every game this season, why is Fletch yeah. out there? What's he doing? This is validation for that. It's validation for beyond just what you think looks right or what people like. It's so easy to be cynical and like shit on stuff. It's so yeah. easy. And Purdue has been the target of that for so long because it's easy. It's an easy punchline. And people have just been knocking Purdue people with it constantly for the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. And now. Yeah, and it now Purdue have, people have ammo. Yeah. We have, and, we have and armor. I, like, and I wrote, people have armor now. Like two months ago, I wrote an article saying it, it how cynicism was so easy when it comes to this team to look at the team and say, oh, well, they didn't do it last year. Or, oh, they haven't done anything. Oh, only March matters. And how I talked about, you know, I believe in this team. I believe in the fact that they can make the Final Four. And I cynicism is easy cynicism gives you a detachment from what you're watching because if a team doesn't make the final four which the vast 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 majority don't you can look back and say oh i knew they weren't going to do it anyway i told you and and maybe you think that doesn't hurt you as much maybe you think you're you're cool and and oh i always knew but that's not fun mm -hmm. you know you got to go all in and i've been all in on this team and to see them Cut down those nets, man. Who, it it was it was something, and I I don't think I I don't think I have anything else I can even say about it. I mean I can't put it into words. It was it was a moment not just for me. It was a moment for everybody who I know who's a Purdue fan. And man, that was beautiful. I yeah I mean, it stretched out even for there wasn't a person. 
I'm sure there was a Tennessee person there too, but they didn't exist after that game. Like there was, there was so much just internal rooting for this moment. Like yeah, across everyone that knows anything that's involved anyway with these people, this program, college basketball, like so easy to root for that. And mm-hmm. like Tennessee deserves their moment too. Like they played well. They um, did. Like, so like I hope one day I I hope next year they get to feel that and get Purdue stop playing them please can, yeah can we just yeah. stop doing it in the tournament we, we get have, in a different played, bracket go somewhere else lot. yeah um because it's always tough and they always play hard and like that's all like I I have a newfound appreciation for every like team that hasn't been there before because like yeah. you kind of get and and Tennessee never has. Yeah, you sometimes get blinded by your own misery too. Yeah, and so like it, it's nice to be able to be like, nah, it, you deserve that too. Yeah, Just go like, do last, it in the west. Go do it in the west region. Tennessee. Yeah, other region. Oh, the last thing I'll say, and it's not about Purdue. It's after all the celebration was over, after everything. I, I say I take that back. Two things. I, I you know I was packing up my stuff and I'm walking from the media row to uh, the media interview room because I had ne- like. At that point, I'd like lost track of time, had no idea when the when the press conferences were or anything. So I'm I'm packing up my bag, I'm going, and there's a couple of dads just like holding little kids, like four, five, six, seven, eight year olds. And as I'm walking down the the media row, they're like, "Hey, hey, hey, can can you grab me like a piece of paper or something?" And I was like, "Huh?" He goes, "Just like w- one of the score sheets or something." <laughs> I, I was like, "Yeah, sure," because you know they hand them out. There's just, right. no hardly anybody takes them. They just leave them there. So, and this happened to me twice as I'm walking down and I, so I just grab one of the sheets and I just hand it to the dad and the kid, the kid was like so excited because now he had something from when Purdue made it to the final four. And like, that's just, that's just cool. Um, and then, so I went into the media room. I had no idea who was up there, what was going on. And it was Tennessee coach up there talking about how, man, you know, he's like, it's, it's hard to, you know, be up here and, and you lose this game. And they were asking him about the officials and they were asking about this and that. But man, just even being in that room, the heaviness of it mm-hmm. just hits you because you're in there with all the Tennessee media guys. You're in there with like the Tennessee employees. They're wearing their, you know, their, their shirts because they're involved in the athletic department somehow. Right. And you got to sit there and listen to them talk about how they just lost. And now they got to go home. And man, it is it is a heavy moment for all those people. And, and I've never really been in that room before. I know you obviously have been in, in difficult rooms, but to see coach Barnes talk about that and just like stand in the back, it, it you really realize how much this means to everyone and why we all care so much and why everybody watching this cares so much because uh, it was, it was a big moment. Yeah. The weight of being so close is yeah. like unspeakable. But you got two unicorns to keep you flying. I do. I do. I, and, the, you know, I think this was only mentioned in the episode we recorded that didn't get posted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Background. But I, I got my two unicorns. Uh, my son made a unicorn necklace for mm-hmm. me, and we and I wore it during the round of 32 game where Purdue absolutely, absolutely stomped Utah State. And uh, now it's a good luck necklace. And uh, my son, as I was preparing to go to Michigan – was like, you have to take your necklace. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I absolutely am going to take my necklace. So I wore it every day. It, it was, uh, a, I mean, it was a bold m- move by uh, Q because, like, he understood, like, it's Final Four, you're going up for adoption. Like, yeah, one basically. or the other. Yeah. And you either so, have good juju in you or you don't. And, and, and so Casey and I will be heading to Phoenix uh, mm-hmm. here in a few days. And I'm, you know, the last thing I will check before I get in my car to go to the airport <laughs> is is the unicorn necklace on because if I were to get to Phoenix and and it not be around my neck, I would just go home, I, or I would have to find a way to make another one and lie to my son, which That's I don't want. Bad to do. energy. Don't want to do. That's yeah, bad energy. Yeah. So. I think that's all we got for this one. I know we went a little long, but you know, if you're going to go long on a podcast, might as well do, do it on the one where you go to the final four. So Casey and I'll be back later in the week to talk NC state, but for then until then 